series, uh, The Road to Repentance. And we're going to be looking at this uh, passage from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along, that's where we'll be. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and read that, and the words will be on the screen. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, sorry, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold, and see, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who had two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and see, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. But then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him. And give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God. For the people of God today, and everybody said, amen. All right. Well, I was watching TV the other night, and I saw something that I haven't seen in a long time, what with streaming services and everything. What I saw was a commercial. And the commercial was one of those that where they pack in a whole lot of offers into a very small, little, limited amount of time. It was an ad for a flashlight. But it wasn't just any old flashlight. It was a military-grade flashlight that had a beam that was so strong it could be seen for over a mile. And it also had a strobe light feature so you could shine it in the eyes of an attacker and repel attacks. It was so strong you could put it under a truck and drive over it with the truck. You could even freeze it in a block of ice and it would still work. And this amazing flashlight was offered for only $29.95, but that wasn't all. You could even get another flashlight. They'd throw in a smaller version, same military grade flashlight, but for your car. So now you got two flashlights for $29.95, but it wasn't over yet. If you called right then, you called right then, the 800 number, they would double the offer for free. So now you get two military-grade flashlights, full-size, two military-grade flashlights for your car, and it's all for $29.95, but you have to act now because 
It was a limited time offer, right? Limited time. It's time sensitive offer, limited time. Have to jump on it right now. Now I tell you, by the time I heard all of this, I was almost ready to get to my phone, except I remembered two things. One, I don't need a flashlight. <laughs> Military grade or not, I just don't need it. And number two, those limited time offers, they're often not all that limited, isn't that right? Yeah, if you see that ad again next week or you see it next year, it's probably still going to be available. I've been seeing that same ad for year after year after year. So I know, I mean, I'm old enough to know that sometimes those limited time only offers are not really all that limited. But that doesn't mean there aren't some offers in this world, some offers in this life that actually are for a limited time, that actually are time sensitive. And that's what Jesus is getting across to his disciples in this story that he told. Now, he told this story that I just read. He told that story around the time when his very own life was reaching its end on the earth. It was that week that we're going to begin celebrating next week, that week where Jesus came into Jerusalem. And at the end of that week, he would be crucified. So Jesus was walking around Jerusalem with his disciples. And his disciples, Scripture said, were calling his attention to all the marvelous buildings in Jerusalem, especially the temple. Now, you all remember, the temple was built out of these gigantic blocks of stone and marble, and there was gilt gold, you know, around the top of the temple. It's a magnificent building. And the disciples are like, man, Jesus, check out this temple. Check out these buildings. Look at this testimony to your know, human ingenuity. Look at this. It's magnificent. But as Jesus is listening to them talk about this, and he's listening and watching them, you know, just being so blown away by everything around them, Jesus kind of bursts their bubble a little bit. He says to them, truly I tell you, as you look around at all these things, he says, truly I tell you, not one stone will be left upon another. Not one stone will be left upon another. In other words, Jesus is trying just to kind of bring his disciples down to earth a little bit and remind them that everything they see around them is perishable. Everything they see around them is indeed perishable passing away. And not only that temple and everything associated with the temple, but as they continue to talk to Jesus, they understand that he also means everything. That one day there will be a time when this world as we know it will pass away, will go away. It's perishable and it's all going to fade away. And Jesus says that's going to happen when he returns. Now, the disciples at this point, they're still trying to wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus has been saying he's going to go away. And now he's talking about how he's going to return. And when he returns, that God is going to kind of bring the curtain down on the world as they know it. And hearing these things, those disciples are thinking the same way we think whenever we hear this kind of stuff. When? When is this going to happen? I mean, come on, you know, Jesus, you're saying this is going to happen, like everything's going to fade away, and there's going to be the end, and Jesus, you know, God's going to bring down the curtain. When is this going to happen? Well, Jesus, <laughs> he doesn't give in to their desire to know when. He says to them this. He says, about that day and hour, nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, not even, only the Father. Only the Father knows. And this is actually a good thing for us to remember, too. When people are saying that the end of the world is here, what we have to remember is the end of the world has been coming ever since Jesus left, and it'll end when he comes back. In the meantime, you know, just enjoy it. Well, you know, enjoy the world. Because there's no way to know when that time is going to be exactly. Only God knows. But Jesus also wanted them to know this. Jesus wanted to just take their minds off the idea of the end of the world and instead be focusing on where they were that very minute, where they were right then. 
In other words, Jesus wanted them to understand that it's not as important to know whether or not the end is near. What is important is to know that your time in this world is dear, that what they do in the world right then is important, and that's where their focus should be, that Jesus has expectations for his people while we have the time, while we are here on this earth. Jesus has expectations for his disciples, and that's in the context of all of that, that he tells this story to his disciples. He tells this story about a man who's going away, and he has all this wealth, so he brings his servants to him, and he divides up his wealth among them with the expectation that they're going to do something with it. Scripture says he called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. And it's important to remember that. He gave each of them what they could handle according to their ability. Because this master expected them to do something. He expected them to multiply that wealth while he was gone. To use that wealth to the best of their ability. And they did. When the master returned, the man who had the five bags of gold, he had five more. He'd made a 100% return on his investment. The next man who had the two bags, he had four. He'd made it a 100% return on his investment. And the master was just so thrilled with them. The master was so happy with them, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Oh, come and share your master's happiness. He was so excited about these servants, not just because they'd made a lot of money, but listen, because they had put themselves in the mind of the master. They had made the master's interest their interest. The master's desires their desires. They had thought like the master. And now, of course, the master says, hey, man, you're like, we're like, we're like buddy. We're like simpatico. Now you can come and you can enjoy also the joy, the happiness of your master. He was so thrilled with these servants, but not so much with the third man. The third man came, the one who had the one bag of gold. He came, and he said, Master, he had a whole different attitude. He said, Master, I know that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. Here, see, this is what belongs to you. And he kind of brings that bag, I imagine, out, you know, and dumps it on the table. It's all muddy and dirty where he's buried it, you know. See, he has a whole different attitude towards his master. And this makes the master angry. He says, you wicked and lazy servant. And now he gets sarcastic. He says, so you knew that I harvest where I don't, have not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit in the, with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. In other words, you think I'm such a mean and rotten and heartless guy. That's all the more reason you should have put the money in the bank at least. But he goes on, he says, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. What Jesus wants his disciples to know is that those who have the mind of the master, those who are in sync with the master of the master's interests at heart, and his desires are their desires, those are the people that will be blessed, and their blessings will be, be, be multiplied. But those like this other servant who are at arm's length from the master, who even doubt, doubt the goodness of the master, oh, well, they'll have nothing. They'll have nothing. 
That's what Jesus wants his disciples to know, that it doesn't matter, number one, what God's plans are for the end of the world. What they should be concerned with is making the most of the blessings that they've been given right now, right then. And the greatest blessing that they had been given was this awesome relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They had this relationship with Jesus in person. They'd been given this awesome blessing. And that's the thing that they should be most happy about. And using that relationship and developing that relationship, making the most of that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's the blessing that you and I have also been given. Amen? Come on. Yes. It's the blessing that we've also been given. It's the blessing that we call salvation, right? It's the blessing we call salvation. And we should be working that blessing, man. We should be making the most of that blessing of salvation. Now, salvation is a couple of things, isn't it? Salvation, you know, often we think of salvation as simply the difference between hell and heaven, right? We're saved. We're saved from hell, and we're saved for heaven. And all that's true. There's no doubt about that. But salvation is even more than that. Salvation is also that day-to-day relationship with God. That day-to-day relationship whereby we become more in tune with Christ, more in tune with Him. Our mind becomes closer in, in relationship with His mind. Salvation is that process by which we start to accept and then embrace the Word of God and Scripture and all of that as formative for us. It's that process by which we accept and then embrace the fact that God, as revealed in Scripture, revealed in Jesus, that that, His will is definitive for us. It's binding for us. That that's the way we want to live our lives. Salvation, it's that process Throughout this life, of those little turnings, those little turnings in repentance, those little turnings every day towards God, where we become more and more, our minds are more and more conformed to the character of Christ. It's that process by which we find ourselves saying, yes, oh yes, I'm happy in Jesus right now. I'm happy in Jesus tomorrow, and I'm going to be happy in Jesus forever. (laughs) It's the process The process by which we are transformed and made ready to just make a seamless transition into the next life where we're living with God forever. Amen? (laughs) That's salvation. Here's the thing. Accepting that salvation and then living into that salvation to not just looking at salvation as a destination, but as a desire to be in tune with Christ, that offer is for a limited time only. We only have this lifetime to accept that offer of salvation and then to work it, to cultivate it, to make the most of it. For our happiness, for the happiness of people around us, for the glory of God. It's an offer that's made to us today, but it's a limited time offer. Now, there are people who would disagree with what I just said. And people who are super smart. And people even back to the early centuries of the church, church fathers who have wrestled with the idea of whether or not salvation really is a time-sensitive offer, okay? There is a theory, and it has support in Scripture, that actually every single human being eventually will be saved, that everyone will be brought into the, the proximity, into the family 
of God. No matter how much a person has resisted God in this life, been evil in this life, have pushed God away in this life, that in the next life, in this next phase, there's a place called purgatory where a person can continue, that soul can continue to be purged of its sin and to be be, that resistance to God can be, uh, can be pushed back, can be lessened, so that eventually every single human being will come under the love of God. That means every single human being, even Satan in this theory, will one day be restored to his place in heaven. What do you think of that? Ah. <laughs> I mean, hey, yeah, that's pretty cool if you think about it. Really? That God's love is so irresistible that no one, no soul will ever be able to resist it at the end. That when this comes down, that the curtain comes down on this world and God renews the, the next world, that he even renews hell. An attractive theory. And I say, there is some support for that. But I also have to say, it's my responsibility to say that that theory of universal salvation, uh, while it does have some support in the Bible, the overwhelming support is not for that. The overwhelming testimony of Scripture is that our opportunity for salvation is limited to the choices we make in this life. So the overwhelming testimony of Scripture does not support the idea that everybody's going to be in heaven one day. What it does support, though, is the truth that while there isn't universal salvation, there is a universal offer of salvation for every single human being. That there is a universal atonement that Christ has died for the sins of every single human being, past, present, and future. Christ has died to pay the price for the sins of all mankind. And that offer, offer of salvation through him is out there for everybody. John says, right? He says, for God so loved what? God so loved the world, everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only son to pay that price. But it is contingent, isn't it? The next part is a contingency. But whoever, whoever believes in him, trusts in him, makes his interests our interests, his desires our desires, whoever believes in him, those are the ones who will not perish and have eternal life. Christ has called everyone to salvation. But it's a salvation that we also need to, to work on, to make the most of, to make our interests, his interests, our interests, his desires, our desires. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. Be of one mind with Christ. Happy. Happy in Jesus today. Happy in Jesus tomorrow. Happy in Jesus forever. That kind of salvation is offered to us for a limited time only. Only while we are on this earth can we make those kinds of choices. It's important that we truly do act now. We act today. <laughs> that we act now. Oh, yes. You know, there's an old uh, story, old pastor story. Maybe you've heard this. But it's about a man who uh, he hadn't been to church in a long, long time, kind of was separating from the body of Christ. 
kind of removing himself, you know, slowly from his faith, kind of not doing all those things to keep up his relationship with, with Christ. So he hadn't been in church for a long time, so the pastor goes to his house, and they sit down in front of a fireplace, two rocking chairs, and the pastor takes a poker, and he pulls out a coal, and he puts it up on the hearth, and then they just sit there, and they just rocking, you know, they're looking at the fire, and the man, who hadn't been at church for a long time, he started to notice that coal, and how it was not glowing as red as it had a few moments before, how after a while it began to turn white and ashen around the edges, and then before too long it was ice cold. And at that point, the pastor got up and said, I hope to see you at church this Sunday. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying, you know, to his disciples. That's what he's saying to us every, all the time, right? I hope to see you with me next Sunday. I hope to see you with me tonight when we review our day. I hope to see you with me all the time. I hope, Jesus says, I hope you stay with me all the time. That you accept this offer of salvation. That you work it. That you, you, you capitalize on it. That you make the most of it today in this life. For your happiness, for the happiness of those around you, for the glory of God take all of that, that, that beautiful relationship, that beautiful of one mindness with Christ, and just take that with you to the next world. That's what Jesus wants from us. And he's offering us that today, but it's an offer for a limited time. Well, next week, we are going to start a new series. It's called Raised to Glory. As we begin to move into Passion Week and then into that glorious season of Easter, next week we're going to be looking at how one man's resuscitation pointed towards the resurrection <clears throat> of Jesus. But this week, again, I'll just remind you one more time, salvation isn't just about a destination, but it's also about a desire today, a desire today. That God's interests, our interests, his desires, our desires. To make the most of our relationship with Him. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's go ahead. We're going to move into our...